All right. So, you know, I want to send out, I want to send out the social media message that we are starting now. Is that a okay. skeet, a tweet, or a toot? Pick one, because I'm not doing it in all three. I feel like you're like one of these. All- one of these turkeys needs to win, so we can I can stop. <laughs> like I, it's just like the skill. I mean, who do you, where do you think our people are? I don't even know. I really don't. I I mean, I don't even know. I I I um. All right, yeah. I'm. I am. Um, I don't even know. You know, what, I'm gonna do nothing. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? You know what? We've got, we've got. We got who they got. Have, I've, I've, they I've, had a chance. They can get it in the podcast if they want. They if they it in the podcast, yeah, yeah. Do us in the podcast. Thinking like I needed a reminder. Well, why don't you tell us which goddamn social network you wanted a reminder on, and we'll remind you on that one next time, okay? And if it's yeah. Nosper, like go take a hike. Forget it. We're not doing it. We're <laughs> got it like or Stoutable or all this other. No, it's like um, LinkedIn. No, thank you. <laughs> Hard pass. <laughs> Our best. All right. Well, so uh, super excited to have we got Matt here. We got John. I think Arian's actually going to join us in a little bit. Um, and I I want to give a or at least for a little bit. Um, Arian is uh, still celebrating the new addition to his family. So um, the new addition to his family may have some other opinions about him being uh, uh, joining us for too long. But I did want to get into some um, Matt before we kind of kicked off with you. I want to get into some kind of prehistory of the the problem that we're trying to solve here, because this is a, this is a thorny one. Um, and Adam, I, I can't remember if you remember some of these super early discussions at Oxide. But the the, the challenge that we had in front of us is we know we're going to make a rack scale machine, and we we know that. Uh, the components of the rack, the sleds of the rack are going to have a host CPU in it. And we know that we're going to need to have some other computer that controls the computer. And this is traditionally called the baseboard management controller or BMC. We decided pretty quickly that we are not going to have a traditional BMC, that we're going to have what we call the service processor, a really stripped down um, microcontroller. Um, although actually from a microcontroller perspective, it's pretty beefy. Um, but it's, uh, it, it is not the full CPU. And if you, I would refer people to our uh, previous episodes of Oxide and Friends on, on hubris and humility. Uh, that is capital H and capital H. Do you, by the way, Adam, do you try searching Hacker News for hubris and humility? <laughs> Never this. I have. It's, it's, uh, it turns out a term, terms that are used very frequently unrelated it's, to our technology. Extremely <laughs> frequently. <laughs> if you were selecting a technology name to be searchable on Hacker News, like uh, hubris is the wrong name to pick. I'm, I'm trying to think of like, what is a worse name to pick for its selectability <laughs> in Hacker News? It's sort like, of like Go is like easier to find. <laughs> Go than... is easier to find. It's yeah. kind of a, it's like a weird cross section of Hacker News to search for hubris because you basically get people accusing one another of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're immediately into Trollville. Yeah. And I've tried searching for hubris and humility. Like, give me just the sentences that contain hubris and humility. And that doesn't improve things very much. It's like, <laughs> I have never seen such hubris. Have some humility, dude. It's like, well, first of all, you're talking about our operating system and our debugger. So could you please not speak of it in vain? But all right. So we, we, we talked about that before, um, and we'll be talking about that. Uh, I'm sure we'll be hitting on that quite a bit today. Well, and just before you move off of BMC's uh, yeah. baseboard man- management controllers, it's just worth noting that these things have become such piles, right? Th- this is the thing that you connect to via HTTP, and it gives you a browser view of the screen buffer, and let you, you, know, you try to flash the BIOS, or you try to you know, install off of a CD. And sometimes it works and often it doesn't. And it's this very mysterious collection of software. Like if you've ever dealt with a server of any kind, you're familiar with the pain associated with it. And when it doesn't work, sometimes people say, well, try this other random firmware version and see if that works. And sometimes it does and sometimes that doesn't. But it's very frustrating and a, and a really terrible part of the server experience. It is a big, big, big mess. Uh, and sadly, some of our colleagues have had to relive that because we have needed to have commodity machines to do development on while we were developing our own hardware. And I feel like poor, poor Josh Cluo. I, Josh. Think, I think he, it was like he was awake during surgery. It's like there is no anesthesia. Um, the, uh. Uh, I, um, so, and I mean, 
there are so many times I'm like, Josh, we should really start a computer company. It's like, I know, I know. I'm at that computer company right now. Like, I'm trying to, it's so, so painful. Um, so the, um, the, uh, as we um, we're thinking about how do we, in particular, how do we connect these service processors, which is like, this is this challenge that you've got to be able to actually connect them over the network which is really problematic. And uh, if folks haven't seen it, our, our colleague Rick Alther gave a great talk at OSFC in 2019 on an exploit that he found um, in BMC's, uh, which is called BMC Anywhere, uh, or I guess USB Anywhere is the name of the exploit. Um, but it, it, use, exploiting this kind of surface area and the network connectivity of the BMC's to be able to potentially remotely own a BMC, which is very bad news, right? Because you, once you control the BMC, you control heaven and earth. So, and it's... these things shouldn't be on the on the network on the internet, rather. But Rick discovered that like millions of them are. Uh, yes, he discovered. Yes, he discovered. I believe he discovered like immediately something like seventy seven thousand that are on the internet <laughs> that that had this vulnerability. I mean, it was like. It, it, oh. it, so bad, bad news. So we want to avoid all of that, but we you still have this problem of like you need a network to be able to connect to these things when they are otherwise powered off to tell them to power on or you, you there's kind of this insurmountable problem. And what the, the thing that we really had uh, embraced uh, or, or were looking to was something called NCSI. And I, this is the part Adam was wondering if you remembered some of those early discussions um, around NCSI. Um, and so I, I do. And this is like one of the, the fancy features of a NIC, right? Yeah. Or, so the, well, the, this is what is allowing that kind of physical cabling to be on, on essentially, this, not, in addition to this kind of high speed in, interconnect, you are on this, this much lower speed inter, or, or lower speed interconnect where you can actually use this thing to talk to a BMC. You can divert traffic. Um, and and th this is the, the network channel sideband interconnect. Um, and, it, you know, it seems really attractive because it means that you can use the same high-speed cabling for this management traffic, for the service processor traffic, which feels like the right answer. Because we, we at the time, we believed we were going to have what I would call kind of a traditional Tioga Pass OCP kind of design where we would have power in the back and network cabling out the front and... God, we don't want to double our cabling. That sounds awful. We'll use the same cabling. And I said something that I kind of regret, that I I, I kind of distilled all this into a catchphrase, uh, NCSI or bust. <laughs> so I don't know if you remember what I'm saying. I just no. ended up remembering very vividly uh, the NCSI or bust. Um, and, the, I, and this one definitely came back to haunt me. Um, as we were, were contemplating this, because as it turns out, uh, the or bust was looking increasingly likely as we got deep into NCSI. And there are a bunch of challenges. And I think actually uh, Arian is here, if you can spot him. Uh, Arian, maybe you can raise your hand and we'll get you up on stage here. Um, and you know we were assuming that this management network would be over NCSI, but but there were a bunch of problems. There was a problem. There were the problems we knew about. Um, and one of the problems we knew about was this, this requires like a lot of firmware to behave correctly, and that always makes us super nervous because firmware often doesn't behave correctly. So that was the kind of the one we knew about. And Arian, do you remember? I mean, I, I was I actually went back to try to find this discussion. But I remember we had a discussion that was like really long. And it was in the summer of 2020, and it was hotter than hell. And people were getting, you know, it's it, it was getting a bit. I mean, I would say heated, but but people were getting frustrated because, in part, because the problem felt very frustrating. And even folks that were advocating for the use of NCSI knew that, like, we yeah, got all these problems. We know we're going to have these problems with firmware reliability and so on. But you know, it just feels like NCSI or bust. I'm like, oh god, I shouldn't have said that. I should never. Have I was it. definitely in that camp though, because uh, I was very pro NCSI because I'd never used it. Everyone who's never used it is very pro. <laughs> um, the the big one though that we really struggled with, which none of the NIC vendors were, uh, or none of our NIC partners were were very well, doing a good job explaining, is how the um, how do you reset the NIC yes, properly that's right. and how, how much can like basically the problem is that uh, the NIC is actually now not really a NIC. It's more like 
a little switch because there's two ports and there's a little um, merging of traffic going on. There's a little rule engine that executes stuff and that merges these flows. And now, how much guarantees do we have that traffic from the from that management interface never en never ends up in the in the queues for the OS? And how or the other way around? How much how much can we make sure that the OS can never spam its own management uh, interface? Uh, and then the bigger part was how do you reset the NIC without resetting the management interface? Because ideally the management interface is a separate sort of portion in the silicon that has its own reset sequence that is reset ideally even using a separate pin from you know your BMC or your your service processor in our case versus the other all the other logic like your heavy lifting logic for the phi and everything else that the OS has control over. The problem is that you need the OS to set up all the, basically all the silicon surface area to get the phi to even work and the link to work. So there's this chicken egg problem and it's, it's, it's really messy. Who can it's reset really what messy. and where and, and how? And, and um, we simply did not get the guarantees. Or we, no, did we, get the, the, we, did, we didn't get the, not even the guarantees. We're not even, we were not even getting the warm fuzzies that this stuff would ever work well. We didn't even get the cold fuzzies. I mean, yeah, we, we would no ask fuzzies. these questions of vendors, and it was just like blank, blank, blank. And you're like, ah. well, the problem is that no one has really implemented this interface. So, yeah, so it, right. the spec is there. It's the the there's a protocol. It's a protocol specification. So it, it tells you how to structure the frames and then what what each party is supposed to do. And um, but nothing in the specification really about the electrical interface, other than that it is RMI, I think, or that's RMI, I, I believe. Uh, but nothing about how their management portion of the sort of ASIC is supposed to work. Therefore, every every implementation does its own thing, and they may do it. They may do it right, but more <laughs> more, more likely right. than not, they just don't, they didn't. Right. And so and and so the, the, we we were looking through some of the documentation, and we were asking. We had a long list of questions for each of these NIC manufacturers. And I remember that we were looking through pieces of documentation and, and, and driver code and whatnot and trying to figure out what happens when you do certain things uh, with the firmware. Can the, OS, can the OS poke the firmware in a certain way to lock the management controller out? And, I, and, and we, we, even from reading documentation, we could already infer that some of these implementations were simply not going to do the right thing. Well, you can already feel like we have left the tarmac. We are off yes. the actual. We we are off road here, and I can like. In fact, we might even not be on a dirt road. We may actually. Like the, the only the only way that we could have really convinced ourselves that this was going to work is if if we would have seen the RTL that actually builds up yeah, the, the device, right. like or at least the reset tree for the device. And no one was obviously willing to share that with us. Uh, definitely not at that stage. So well, and even yeah. our more our, our kind of our best partners, more, most forthcoming folks were like, "Boy, we do not get these questions. Like, never exactly heard this question. Like, that yeah. is not a good sign because we feel like we're asking the kinds of questions that anyone should be asking. Who is you? And it's and then so we we are you mentioned the reset concerns, which were really deadly, but and the power domain concerns were really deadly. Oh like, yeah, these were super messy too. Like some parts because the the the, the chip each of these chips consists of several power rails that you need. Uh, some of them are actually like, like, I think like five or six rails. It's, it's, it, these are fairly complex devices because a lot of them do a lot more than just being a NIC. They have, uh, they, they have a DRAM controller <laughs> in them. They have, they have, <laughs> they have one or more CPU cores in them. Some of them have a lot of CPU cores in them to be it's a, a smart NIC, smart NIC please. It's a smart yeah, NIC, but, NIC, and so there's, there's a lot of power circuitry in order to, to power each of these more complex pieces. The Phi itself for a hundred or 200 gig link. Um, usually has three power three power rails for the like two for the analog portion and then one for the digital portion and and there's PLLs and you know the whole whole shebang like it's fairly complex like stuff and then they load it up with all sorts of features in order to enable these storage applications and I don't know like you know the kitchen sink gets put in this thing um, and and so even powering one on. Is uh, actually less than straightforward, and it gets really messy. But like, if you want to, because our our, our, our server design is very, uh, we have we're, we're very deliberate about power domains, and we can we have a sort of monotonic ramp where where pieces are enabled depending on the power domain that the machine is in, so that we can also power stuff off properly if needed. Um, in order to, for example, conserve power if you don't need need the, the machine or or whatever for whatever reason, and that got really messy with 
part of the chip wants to be in one power in, in an earlier power domain than all the stuff that is running when the host CPU is running, but you can't run a chip halfway. That 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 just that's not a not a mode that has ever supported. And so right. you would have to power the NIC on before the, the host CPU is powered on. And then at what state does the host CPU find the NIC? Uh, unclear. And how much of how much initialization of the NIC needs to be done by the host OS versus the the your service processor or your BMC. So it it got real messy real quick. And so uh, as much as I really wanted that solution to work, uh, the, 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 the Robert in particular convinced me that this was we were going to be in for a world of hurt. And I, I just, think it was that, one I of think these. Yeah. Right. Well, and it was one of these things where you could just tell that every step is a step in the wrong direction. This has happened only a handful of times in my own career where you could just realize that like we are down the wrong path. And, you know, I, <laughs> a friend of mine was at a company and left abruptly um, after a very short stint. And I was asking him like, boy, boy, boy what happened? And he said, you know, there's, there, there's, there's an old proverb. Um, if you find yourself down the wrong path, go back. I'm like that's that's a pretty good proverb, um, and so I think we realized that we needed to go back. And and meanwhile, something else had happened that was really important, and that was that we had made a big decision about how we were going to cable the system. And instead of having cabling out the front, we were really aggressively exploring a cable backplane and blind mating into it. We talked about that um, with Doug a couple of episodes ago. And we began to realize, like, wait a minute. Now, this major argument for NCSI was reducing the cabling burden for the operator because we would we didn't want to double the cabling. But if it's a cable backplane you're blind mating into, it's like operator doesn't care if you know you're using with the, a couple of those differential pairs for for a, a, the management network. So the, it, I think all of these things kind of added up. And yeah, Aryan, there was this moment where, and I think it was, again, because this had been, you know, I, and I would quite say contentious, but there definitely had been like folks who are like, NCSI is a mistake. And no, we need to do NCSI. And then there's me having to reconcile my, with my past self saying NCSI or bust. And because I really wanted it to work too. But we're just coming to the conclusion, like, this is the wrong path. We need to stop. We need to go back. And we need to do this problem that was actually a, a problem that we were resisting because it is also thorny, which is the alternative. And what's the alternative? The alternative is you need a separate management network. So what yeah, that means we called is... called that the bag on the side for a while. That's, <laughs> that's, how, that's how not we want... Well, the, oh, this, I mean, was really, yeah. this was really a thing where we had a clear... Like not split is maybe the wrong word, but there were definitely two camps. There was one group of people like NCSI is definitely what we want. And then the other was, we should not do this ever because it is such a, and, and then the interesting thing is though, that once we laid it out on a table, everyone agreed though, that it was not the right decision to push for that. And that yeah. we should find an alternate, like a different way to implement this, which was and I remember this very vividly because I was smack in the middle of writing up the design for what the networking switch was going to look like. Because at that point, we were already working on our own design because we'd already done, we'd already come to the conclusion that we wanted to do an ex, like an externally PCI connected device, not put the host CPU in there. So we were already on our own path. But then, then the question became like, what is that separate network going to look like? Are we going to stick that? Is that going to be a separate chassis? Is that going to be Cat five sort of cabling or Cat six cabling? That looks gross. Like, how do we how do we deal with that? Um, and so, well, it, 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 sorry. And, the, and yeah, well, then you get the kind of the, the decision that we're going all in on the cable backplane kind of coming in there, which, um, it, but we still, and we're doing our own switch, but this means now we are going to have a second switch effectively. We're not going to do one switch, we're going to do two. And Arian, do you want to um, talk, actually, before you talk about it, because I, I, I I had asked you earlier, and I, I, I know, again, you've got the new addition to the family at home, so I know thank you very much for, for taking some time away from your journey leave to, to talk about this. But I had asked you prior to this for the origin story of what we have come to call the management network, which is monorail. And I thought I knew what the origin was, but now I am worried that I am doing the thing that Adam accuses me of and sculpting history i'm like retconning my own history so now i i 
I and Adam, it really, it, you have to understand that it, it's it, it's painful for me to make it this. This sounds painful, and I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Am I making it sound sufficient? Yeah. Painful? It really is like I mean, I, I I think it's our chest pain's normal when you're saying things like this. Um, but so I thought I knew, but now I went through my chat history. I'm like, now I am a lot less certain. So, Arian, before you describe what it is, could you describe the origin of the name monorail, or maybe you need to describe what it is to get to the origin of the name. The name is somewhat technical in in in, in nature, but it uh, so actually I think Keith was the one who coined the term. Um, and Wait the a reason, minute, you're, you're punting this, Keith. We can't. Get no, no. no. So here. Keith 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 came up with the name. I know why it is called monorail, but Keith. Okay, okay, good. I, I I don't want to. I don't want to claim that I I coined the the, the 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 I gave it the name monorail because I did. Okay. Um. I did. I did like the name a lot, and I carried it forward, and and I, I wrote it down a lot so that everyone else started calling it that. So that that I guess that that I did do. But um, so the problem or the, th the so why the name monorail? Well, uh, this whole network came to be out of a, a quite a few constraints because um, yes, we had to do what we wanted to do now was a secondary ASIC in the same chassis. Because we didn't want to use a, sec a separate chassis, so we didn't want to cheap out and just take an off-the-shelf shelf switch and then try to squeeze that into the rack with, that, with the additional cabling. Now, so that was that was part number one. Then the problem then became how many ports do we need? Because we have 32 servers in this, uh, 32 sleds in the in the uh, in the rack, plus then two switches themselves that need to be connected. We want a technician port on each, one or more technician ports on each switch so that you can. So that that is connected to that is uh, accessible on the front of the rack, so that you can connect a laptop or something into the rack, so that you can do uh, management functions. Um, and then we had the power shelf controllers that we wanted to connect. So, f so very quickly, the number, and then we wanted an interconnect between the management network and the main switch, the Tofino ASIC that we have. So that we very quickly ran into this thing where it's like, oh, how many ports do we need? Well, it turns out we needed something like thirty-seven ports, if I remember correctly, and Matt can correct me if I'm wrong here. Either 36 or 37. Um, and so finding an ASIC that was even suitable that could that had that many ports was kind of challenging because um, if you go, you, you, you would think like, oh, well, there's like 48 port switches on the market. And yes, there are 48 port switches on the market. But the way these are constructed is either, usually they have one central so, so one switch asic and then uh, you need sort of supplementary or complementary uh, ic's or chips that make up then phi's that give you then all these ports and the way that they uh they connect these things together is using a uh, sort of like industry pseudo standard called qsgmii uh, with S with sgmii standing for uh, a, a serial gigabit uh, uh inter independent interface and then the quad is then you can combine four of those in a single transceiver, so a single send receive pair on your printed circuit board. And then so you can do four links through that. And so you have these sort of breakout chips. So these chipsets in 48 gig switches usually consist of uh, uh, one switch that, can, that has, for example, 32 ports accessible. Uh, and then you need to sacrifice some of those. And then you can use these quads to then to get to 48. So it's, like, it's a bit of a puzzle to get there. Because all these ASICs say they support something like 50 ports, but that, those are logical ports. They're not actually physically bonded out on the IC and therefore accessible to you to build a network with. So, so the puzzle there was how do we get to um, a number of ports that we, like physical ports that we actually need? How do we do that in a set, in a, in a, as little, like the smallest number of uh, integrated circuits that we can buy because all these things cost money we were in this like remember we were so th we're, we're talking now summer 2020 we're starting to get really deep into the you know parts are not going to be available all the suppliers have pulled their supply their their inventory from the distributions or the, the distributors so you have to go to each individual um, uh, silicon manufacturer and ask them for inventory um, the automotive industry is, is transitioning to Ethernet, so there's lots of e like lots of Ethernet that is going into automotive applications. Now, unfortunately, not so much these switch ASICs, so that that's okay. But um, you know, we're small fish, so getting getting enough inventory is, is problematic because you're 
if if there isn't no, if there's only so many of them to go around and there's someone who like a bigger organization that places an order then you, you might be screwed um and then the final piece was we wanted so there's only so many ways in which you can actually connect systems together and traditionally you do that using uh twisted pair ethernet uh or or, or cat cabling um and the problem there is that a hundred gig or yeah a hundred megabit link uses four like two pairs uh four conductors uh, a gig link uses eight conductors and so initially we don't really need a hundred like a hundred meg is fine but it would be nice if you had a path to a gigabit in the future because you never know how much data you're going to be pushing through these links you might want to change at some point parts of the design and then you know you might be doing um uh, you might be doing like larger software updates through this. Like you might be distributing a uh, several hundred megabyte uh, OS package or something through this thing to 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 you, as your first your first um, you know your stage zero, zero, one or two of your OS loader. Um, and so you don't know how that evolves. And so you have this discrepancy between two conductors or four conductors and eight conductors. And then twisted pair Ethernet relies on um, uh, magnetics on, on inductors to decouple two systems together. That's how you can have two, uh, two hosts connected using, you know, 100 to 200 meters of Ethernet cable in two different buildings on two different, um, uh, uh, two different power circuits uh, without uh, having currents flow between these two, uh, these two buildings in ways that you don't want to. And the problem is that these magnetics, if you look at a nick, you can see th those are pretty visible. They're like these larger, a chunky square black, usually they're like these black square uh, cube thing looking things that sit right behind the ethernet uh, jack. And um, if we wanted to put 30 something of those on a circuit board, that's a significant chunk of real estate. And we, we simply did not have that real estate. So then how do you over, like, First of all, we don't want to deal with this four conductors versus eight conductors for hundred for hundred megabit hundred megabits or one gig, and then how do we do this in a way that you don't need these magnetics? Now, so there's there there are some some trickery that people have done with if you're staying you know on the same power circuit roughly, then maybe you don't need these these inductors, and then you can AC couple uh, twisted pair Ethernet. But there's no specification for any of that. Some chips sort of support it. Some some say they do it may not be validated so you're definitely in like sort of undetermined land and you're you're building something that you're going to be on the hook for and and it might not be compatible with anything else that you might uh like any ics that you might buy in the future so that's not an, an ideal situation so ultimately the situation the, the the solution we landed on was that the the switch asic that we picked for microchip um exposes most of its uh certies most of its, its ports over SGMI, uh, the the serial gig uh, independent interface, uh, uh, independent interface. Oh, I forgot what the acronym is for, um, which is uh, a a loosely defined thing from Cisco that Cisco used between um, that is uh, it's effectively used between GBIX, the optical transceivers, and and uh, gig uh, uh, Max, um, a media independent interface. There you go. Um, and, but then in a serial form, so it goes over two conductors uh, or a send, uh, two differential pairs. Uh, so you have one send, one receive. And that's where the monorail name came from because you have basically one transmit receive pair in order to have mo one mono to uh, build up a link. And so the, and then the, um, the, the nice property that we got from that is that um, SDMAI in its in its sort of standard as it is is an lvds signal that you can ac couple meaning that it, that uh, you don't need to have two circuit boards uh connected with two grounds you can um uh, you, or you're not relying on the ground to uh, for your for your signal levels um so you're using differential signaling between the two systems that is very similar to how an existing uh, 10 gig 100 gig uh, link already works and so the, the same cabling that we would use in the backplane for the 100 gig link, the same twin X would be perfectly suitable to also run that LVDS signaling over. Contrary to twisted pair um, CAT cables are slightly different. They, they work different. Um, they don't have a shield, or, well, CAT7 now does, but um, 
Cat Seven is actually just Twin X, so it could have worked. But um, so this this looks much closer to uh, the hundred gig link that you already have between the main switch ASIC and the host, except now uh, it's just a gig link. Um, but then we can um, we can uh, uh, gear that down so the the link in practice runs at one, uh, or we we do an actual one hundred megabits uh, of traffic over it. But the link is one hundred or one gig capable. So in the future. If we have faster parts, we can we can use one gig if we wanted to, and we don't have to change any cabling. We don't have to, and it, and the switch itself would still be compatible. So there's this was a long puzzle to make work, uh, which took um, I don't know two three months to complete. I think uh, before we were all in agreement how this thing was going to look. Um, so yeah, that's how that's how we ended up there. Long story. We and so as you can imagine, the much shorter story that I had in my head was that this was what. I think anyone, certainly anyone from Gen X, and indeed most millennials, would think when you say monorail, it's Marge versus the monorail. I mean, you immediately get the Simpsons reference. Well, I, I, and, that might have been in there, but that, that, that I don't know. I don't well, know. I I don't know knowing that Keith originally coined this, I kind of feel we kicked this. I mean, clearly it's got a, I mean, this just makes it a very good Simpsons reference. Is that it's How one of those Simpsons, Simpsons that has Keith watched? I don't know. Uh, I, I feel, Adam, we can answer that question on yeah, behalf of Keith. Yeah, I, 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 lots. I, I'm I'm almost ready to ask Keith this question because he'd be like, "No, you dummies! Of course, it's the Simpsons reference." What else? <laughs> would it be? Right. The, the uh, but what I do know, and Ari, and this is why I was confused about. I guess I went back to chat. What I do have is a, a private chat between us, um, and this is in November of 2020, when the uh, um, you say the first. This is the first reference to monorail I can find anywhere in kind of Oxide's history. Is you saying to me, "I'm dying here with a monorail song." I guess I'll go by Lyle going forward. Uh, Lyle Laneley being the character from the Simpsons episode. So clearly, I, I now well, I think it, when I, once once the name came to once the name was you said it, watch obviously the said the link. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, and it is a. Uh, and so when I wasn't sure if I was going to be able, be able to get a hold of you today, I did. I I called Robert, and I'm like, hey, Robert's also not able to join us now. But I'm like, hey, Robert, what is what is your recollection of the uh, of the origin of the name? And he's like, if you are looking for my permission to retcon it into a Simpsons reference, you have my permission. I'm like, all right, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm looking for. And that was great. That was a wow, quick, quick phone call. That was, that was good great. show. I'm, I'm what pretty good sure show. that the yeah. very first time it came up was actually in a meeting. It was a like it was it was a spoken thing. Like I think so he'd, too. He referred to it immediately as monorail. For multiple reasons, one of which was the the it's going to be an SGMI link, and so but yeah. then like definitely the whole circumstance of how the thing came to be was very Simpsons esque. So yes, he, that's but great. It, well, it, it is a great name, and it is a and I think it's you know, and I remember even you at the time because this is a problem that you were really wrestling with. Like, how do we do this? It feels like a very over constrained problem. And uh, the, the 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 method that you found to do this in terms of using the, the what 100 FX right in terms of the, uh, the I don't know if you want to describe a little bit like the path that a packet takes uh, as it as it as it goes over the monorail but it is uh, it's it's kind of wild and this was one of those where where Arian I just remember you saying I don't know why this wouldn't work and you were asking other people and that was the answer you were getting from a lot of people like i don't know why this wouldn't work but it is weird and i've definitely yeah, no never done seen this. it yeah so the problem here was that the uh yeah because the constraints i laid out that those are those were only part of it because the, the 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 thing that we were struggling was the the service processor we picked has an rmii interface one rmii interface so you can connect to one ethernet Mac, or it has an Ethernet Mac that is exposed using an RMI interface, and you so you can connect to one Ethernet thing, whether that's so that can be an Ethernet Phi, so you can you can have a physical copper connection to a, you know an Ethernet network like an Ethernet switch using an, a, a Cat six or Cat five Ethernet cable, um, or probably you can use it. You can connect RMI interfaces like Mac to Mac. You can connect directly to a switch. Which exposes its its Mac over RMI that will probably work, uh, but there's no guarantees that it will. Um, I found some discussions, for example, on a TI messaging board where people were asking that question, like, "Hey, can I take the RMI interface from this microcontroller and connect it directly to the switch?" And there were there was some back and forth over whether or not that was 
that was supported and it was def it was not it was not, had not been validated in in silicon so they didn't know if it was supported you you were on your own to try so we were definitely off in land like oh they, they we're, we're 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 definitely going off the beaten path because what we ultimately wanted was that single rmii connection needed to go to two independent switches because because we wanted a redundant management plane and so the the you, you you I need to we need to post a diagram to make this visible because it, it will be it's kind of too difficult to explain or a visual helps a lot but basically we're going from the service processor that has one RMI connection to a small three port switch that sits right next to it that so one of those links is then that RMI link to the service processor with two remaining links that are then available to go to a to to two switches in the rack so that you have two independent management planes and then we're we're using some vlan trickery to keep these these two paths separate um in the host and or in the service processor so that you have two truly independent paths that can be active that can both be active and you don't have any any switching loops etc um but the the problem was i could not simply find a we could not find a small switch that would have one rmii interface and two sdmii interfaces because that was ultimately what we wanted because we wanted to connect those sdmii interfaces then through the backplane to the switch asic that sat in a different chassis in the switch chassis and so ultimately what we ended up with was a there's a there's a phi part from microchip which exposes uh an SGMI interface on one side and a uh, or two SGMI uh, rather two SGMI interfaces on one side and uh, two um, hundred FX, which is the original hundred megabit fiber standard, which is not really a standard. It's also a little bit loose to find um, on the other side, and that thing actually in this case acts as a media translator. So we're going service processor using an RMI interface to a little switch. Which then has an 100FX link to a to a um, a phi, which then goes SGMI through the backplane cabling and then into this into the rack switch itself, where then the link is is connected to a Mac on the other end. And yes, this was very much a. I drew it up and I we asked. Uh, I remember emailing back and forth with some FAEs for microchip in. Uh, uh, this is their division in Denmark. And they definitely said, like, yes, this is uh, this should work in theory, but no one has ever built this. This is why would you do this? This is the, the, <laughs> because because effectively what we've done is, in, in if you look at how this would look in a traditional sense, the phi that normally sits in the switch chassis now sits in another chassis across a cable. Like we we basically taken part of the part of the switch and put it in every server, which is which is kind of kind of weird, but it. It works, and it, uh, it 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 now exposes a clean SGMI interface to the outside world from both the switch and the and the, and the host. Um, and so, in the future, if there ever is a microcontroller, for example, that has an uh, that has an SGMI interface, or uh, maybe even two SGMI interfaces, that would be absolutely great. Um, we could connect them natively, or if we find a small switch that that has two SGMI interfaces and an RMI link, we can replace the, the Mac and fi, the Phi plus that little switch with one part, or, and this is a path we can even go potentially explore, we can even drop the SGMI and we can do some jiggling and like do 100 effects too, because it, it turns out the signaling is electrically similar enough. And then we can do, use some configuration magic using our, our third management network to then bring the link up, but that's <laughs> maybe a story for another time. Right. Spoiler, there's another network behind the network behind the network. Yes. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll Ari, and, Ari, I think you're skipping the funniest part, which is that it's impossible to find a standard for 100 base FX. Like no one believes yeah, there is, this. There is no standard. Like, yeah, you I'm cannot, sure there's no the actual original, standard for this. I, I think the original basically like 3Com or someone made something, either 3Com or Cisco, someone made something to connect GBix to a Mac and basically they needed something to connect these these fiber transceivers to to a to a switch ASIC on a PCB and someone invented something and they sort of loosely drew it up and then they gave that specification to all the GBIC vendors and everyone has just been sort of implementing this but there is no specification for this like no one can tell you exactly what the electrical specification of this like what what the voltage levels are uh, I I don't know how that whole world works, but it does somehow. And, so and it, 
it's a hope and I mean, a prayer. That link when we were trying to bring it up, like, is it AC coupled? Is it DC coupled? Do you have to pull it up? Do you have to terminate it? I mean, you ended up figuring out experimentally, if I remember right, by just swapping. Yes, a bunch yeah. Of well, it should capacitors. it should work either DC or AC, and uh, it turned out that in our case, one side really wants to pull up the other, like, really wants it to be pulled up. It, it actively does that, and then the 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 source didn't like that, so we had to do AC coupled. And then biased and I don't know, like a bunch of trickery. But yes, that, that was an experimental setup. We basically built a prototype using some of our proto boards. And then we added components and we removed some components until the link worked. And so, Matt, this is a great point to get you into the story. Because uh, so you, by the time you had come to Oxide in kind of like, what, like uh, the September of 2021... We had figured out that this crazy. We wanted to do this crazy thing. You'd kind of come after we'd already come to this conclusion of doing this thing that like uh, should work, but no one has done it. And why would you do it that way? Um, and this is kind of, to a certain degree, drops on your lap of like, hey, so now we need to make all this software work. Um, and in particular, yeah, exactly. But Matt, please make this work. And in particular, uh, I just remember, you know, Arian, you and I shortly before Matt started going through the VSC 7448 manual. And like, I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, it's obviously complicated, but holy God, is it complicated? And in particular, there's a MIPS core in there. And you're like, no, no, don't worry. Like, we're going to, we're not no, going to no, 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 use no. MIPS core. One core in there. Or are you talking about the switch? Oh, that was the switch. The, the, yeah, the yeah, switch. No, no, no. The, well, with the switch, we knew that there was a MIPS core in there because no, I knew we the, the, but the it's dev like, thing runs Linux. It's like a full-on Linux machine. Right. And so I don't think I realized, again, that was kind of like this dawning moment of like, holy God, like, yeah, okay, second switch, ha, ha, ha. No, you actually need a second switch operating system. Now. No, no, no. The Dude. manual is, is a couple thousand pages. It's a couple thousand big. pages long. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a long manual. So Matt, you started and this was kind of your, I mean, this is like, you oh, know, you were looking like, hey, how can I, where can I chip in? And it's like, yeah, we've got no one looking at the software side of this. So I think, if I recall correctly, Matt, one of the first things you did is bought the dev kit for the 7448. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? Yes. So Arian, I showed up and Arian was like, here, uh, just expense this. I think it was like a $2,400 dev yeah, kit. Yeah, $2,000 dev kit. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not cheap. And it is built like a tank. Like it's got half inch acrylic mounting plates on either side of the PCB. So I could throw this down the stairs and it would be fine. Um, You would, well, you would, you would, Yes, it would be fine. The stairs would not be fine. And it's not even clear to me. The thing is gigantic. It's like physically huge. So do we oh, yeah. still have pictures in the in the uh, in from our, our accident friends about the dev boards? I think I put pictures in the in the in the album of one of our gimletlets mounted into like I, I hacked it into the into my dev board dev unit. Like it's it's screwed in. Like the, the gimletlet sits under the acrylic. Well, that, that that's yeah, that's your picture. But I have a, there's a picture where I put my my um, a gimletlet inside the thing, and and then and then wired it in because one mode and one of the modes in which we can run the switch ASIC is you can basically tell the CPU to always stay in reset and never bother, and we connect Spy to our service processor instead, and so the service processor then runs our own driver that we've written to bring this whole thing up. So we bypass the whole MIP CPU. That thing never. Um, that thing yeah, never. So, uh, Adam's asking never people to please post vectors. Um, because yeah, let they... me go. On. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, so Matt, you, you, yeah, you I would describe up, I get, getting I get a hold this of this kit. Yeah. Yeah. So I get this dev kit, and it is bigger than I expect, and so I like unpack it and try to find, fit it on a desk in my tiny apartment. Uh, and like Arian said, so the the plan here all along was this thing has a MIPS core. We do not want that core running uh, for the typical oxide reasons like we want to be able to own the firmware that runs on it we want to have a good amount of trust in the system and we also don't want like another yet another processor we keep finding them in various places uh and so the plan all along had been we are going to keep that core and reset which you can do with pin strapping and then configure it over spy because over spy you can read and write registers and like it's a chip if you set registers to the correct value it will behave in the correct way um, and that was kind of the plan all along and I don't know if anyone quite realized how many registers we would have to set to the correct values before this chip would actually come up. Uh, no, we did not. Editor's voice. Oh, Narrator's oh, voice. They definitely I, I, did. Had, I had some sense. I just kicked it down the road. I was like, I, I can't <laughs> think about it because then I, I, I don't, I, I start to hyperventilate because we just don't have enough time <laughs> to build it. I know I knew that it was going to be lengthy and because I had, I had at some point, 
because the driver is open source. And so I had, I had spelunked a little bit through the driver to figure out like, okay, how, how does this look? And, uh, well, as you might expect, it is a large blob of C and it is, you know, pretty dense, but lots of stuff that is not really documented as you would expect. Um, I think Matt's got yeah, some opinions so on all this. So it's interesting. So like the, the chip has kind of three layers of documentation. There is the data sheet, which is 520 pages and is a PDF attached to that PDF, because that's a thing that semiconductors like to, semiconductor vendors like <laughs> to do. There is another PDF, which is the list of <laughs> registers in the chip. And that one is 845 pages. And it turns out that neither of those data sheets is actually sufficient to bring up the chip. Uh, so I, I put a link in the chat to Mesa, which is the microchip ethernet switch API. And to their credit, it is open source. It's on GitHub. Uh, you can go look at it. And the canonical way to bring up the chip is to use Mesa uh, to the point where if you have problems with the chip and you ask microchip for help, they will say, why aren't you using Mesa? We can't help you. Have you seen how big the data sheet for this chip is? Good luck. Um, <laughs> so we've had, we've had issues with that in the past. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of the bring up was just tracing through their SDK and figuring out what exactly it's doing, um, because the chip is, you know, 54 ports, 80 gig, it can be configured in any number of ways. Well, did, we didn't using you write it. a sort of a soft emulator for this thing that would basically yes. log all the reads and writes that would happen? Yeah, so at one point in a state of desperation, I took their SDK, I compiled it on my own personal computer, and I replaced all of the register reads and writes with calls that would print what it was trying to do. And then by running switch startup, I could get this very robust log of every register operation that it would try to do, and then compare that against my own configuration code and see what was different, basically. Uh, which was also fun because there was no switch attached. So in certain cases, their code would try to read registers and expect certain values. So I had to add a bunch of special cases of like, oh, when it reads this status register, return 12, because that's the right value to keep the, the startup going in the code. Yeah, absolutely brutal. And as I recall, you, you discovered a lot of it, 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 issues that way, there were, like issues that were preventing the thing from working by effectively understand, like tracing through for things that, as it turns out, were very load bearing. Um, oh, and yeah. I, I, there, there were several cases where I got to the point of like, I know there's one thing that I have configured wrong, and you know, someone that has been using this chip for longer than I have could probably tell me in 15 minutes. Uh, but I have not been using the chip for that long, so it's going to be another two weeks of struggle. I think one of the big ones was jumping a little bit ahead when we were trying to bring up QSGMII. Um, so like Aryan said, we picked this chip because it has a lot of surdays and we can connect it directly to almost every service processor in the system, uh, but not everyone. I think it has like 35 surdays and we need 40 or something like that. Yeah, we have, no, it has 32. I mean, I th uh, 32 and I think we need 36. So we needed a couple. Yeah. Of, we need a, so we use one QSGMII to four times SGMII sort of media converter chip from MicroSemi. And that was the, the root of many problems uh, because <laughs> it, it turns out that for some reason, uh, one of, there are many different modes you can operate the chip in. One of the modes is ganging up groups of four surdays um, to do a single XAUII link, I believe, which is a 10G yeah, link a 10, running across 10 gig four link. Lower. Yeah. And, uh, when you're doing that, those four surdays are all chained together. Like they all are cooperating to send a single data stream. And if you don't want that cooperation, you have to turn off this feature uh, because it's on by default. And that right. took us right. like two months to figure out. Eventually, <laughs> Ari had finally tracked it down. Well, yeah, yeah there's, so. there's like the set, there's a setting where it basically, because if you want a link to behave, then uh, a Xaui link to behave the way it needs to, you need to have all these link be driven by the same clock. And basically what it does is it, there's, there's this one bit that you need to set or unset rather in our case, that basically distributes the clock to four, that, 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 that quad of those, of those surdies. And unless you do that, um, uh, they will all be together on the same PLL. So one of the links will work, but all the other ones will break. And we had some really interesting behavior where it would, <laughs> it, everything was fine until we, br we brought that link up and then suddenly one of the other links started misbehaving or one went down. I forgot what the, what the, what the, what the. Yeah, no, it was like the links were grouped in sets of four for this XAUII thing. Right. Uh, and so I discovered like, oh, for some reason ports, you know, 53, 54 and 55 only work if port 52 is up. We're like, what the heck does this mean? Well, and this and, is and, what and, knows and, where and, you're and, just and, like, and, I and, know. 
th- th- there's there's going to be like one underlying cause that's going to just that is going to explain all these symptoms. But I I've got no idea what on earth it could be. It just makes no sense that all of a sudden this other port, you know, three ports away, starts behaving differently depending on how I configure this port. Yeah, this was around the same time when we uh, when Eric actually physically soldered a probe to the QSGMI link, and we captured a bunch of data on the oscilloscope, and then um, reverse analyzed it to figure out the packets that were going through there. Yeah, and you have uh, a great I, blog entry on that, Matt. Yeah, that, I just put yeah, a right. I was going to say yeah. chat here. Yeah, and can you describe tuning that link remotely? I think that's a good story. <laughs> yes. So this was another uh, setup where um, I didn't actually have a full sidecar in my place because they're huge they're even bigger than the the sdk that i or the the dev kit that i showed you a picture of and so eric had one in his basement and the way we tuned it was he set up a google meet with a webcam pointed at an oscilloscope and i connected remotely to a computer that was plugged into that network switch uh, and then just twiddled survey parameters until i got some good looking links i did not know that oh my gosh oh yeah yeah, it was like a Google Meet. He went out to get lunch, and uh, yeah, I spent a while tuning this, and eventually got something that looked nice. Here, let me see if I can get a. Um... One of the tricks, of course, that Matt had to figure out was that in order to trigger the scope, it needed to see you know the right kind of transition, and so he had to keep knocking the thing out into like La La Land, and then bringing it back so that the scope would retrigger, and he could see what he was doing. Uh, by the way, we know that we have that uh, in the chat. You know, I ask if we know that they have web interfaces. Yes, we do know that they have web interfaces, but this is just much faster because everyone already runs Meet all the time anyway. So, you know, quickly point a webcam and Meet, and you're good to go. The other funny thing about this, which I kind of just learned on this project, is the this is kind of the worst. So, like, when you're doing very slow links, you don't have to care about tuning them. When you're doing this speed of, like, 1G links, you have to kind of manually tune them by hand, which is annoying. And once you're up to, like, 10G links, you don't have to manually tune them anymore again because they're so fast that they have to tune themselves. <laughs> right, right. It's actually not possible to manually tune it. So you are yeah, actually so in you're in the actual valley of despair from manual tuning. Exactly. Yeah. Well, to be is... fair, Matt, when you interviewed, I asked you because you've been doing motor platforms for three D printing, and uh, I asked you why you want to do some of this, and, you, and I remember you saying, "Well, I want to work on some solid state electronics for a while. You know, no moving things." I'm like, oh, do we have the project for you? No moving things. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There are no fluids. There are no uh, no liquids. Yes. That's great. I mean, there, there are fans, but that's a, that's a subject for a different episode. Yeah, that is awesome. I see, and then we, it, when was it along here that you discovered the firmware payload that needs to be loaded onto this thing? So that was actually uh, on when we we're working on the Phi side of things. Um, that's the so side. Have, okay, right. Yes, yeah, so like yeah, the, the that monorail, was much like, earlier. The, yeah, we had kind of known about this for a while where all of the PHI data sheets, so the PHIs are the chips um, which are kind of doing the end of the network. So they are the things that give you RJ45 jacks on your technician port. Uh, and then we also use them as port expanders kind of inside the system to break QSGMII into four SGMII links. And all of the data sheets have like a mysterious line saying, load the firmware update or like load the configuration somewhere in their setup, which is left unexplained. And it turns out that is also in the Mesa SDK. And most of the time, it involves patching an 8051 core that lives somewhere inside the PHI. Uh, so if you search the Mesa repo for the word 8051, you find all kinds of stuff. Uh, this code is also in the Linux kernel, by the way, because I originally looked at both the, the, their open source code and the Linux kernel. It has a different, different implementation because I couldn't work it out how to, how to exactly do it. Because the way that they reset this thing is pretty gnarly. Like they, they set some bits to sort of trigger a reset and then they fault it or something. And then they, like it spins in some place and then they load stuff in RAM and then they give it a kick and then it resets itself and then jumps back into the code that they just patched. But it, it is... Uh, Jesus. Yeah, no, it, it, it does not san- sound sanitary. You, like, you, you can really, also kind of... You got to wear gloves the- with this stuff. You can trace the layers of IP where, like, there's the outer phi where you just set registers and it does stuff. There's whatever IP they're wrapping inside of that where you have to, like, go through a different register and you have indirect writes where you write a data payload and an address, and then the chip goes off and does that write on your behalf. And there's actually one that's nested too deep where you have to use indirect writes to configure an indirect write. Uh, So, like, two layers down, some IP core inside the chip eventually gets your message. 
Wow. And I mean, I guess on the one hand, and it, it is not a surprise. I mean, we I'm sure there, there are many 8051s in the oxide rack that we don't know about that are sitting on the other side of these various controllers. But uh, this is one that we were uh, having to deal with more directly than, than others and that we were actually handing this thing firmware bundles and so on. And then those ended up being load-bearing, right? Not, I mean, it ended up being really important to get this thing kind of the right sequence. Oh, yeah, because the, the payload actually has a 100FX fix. Like, there's, a, there's an errata that they document where they, they, they explain that sometimes the link doesn't come up in 100FX on one side unless you apply this patch. Um, so, yes, this is load-bearing for us. We have to have this applied because it, it probably won't work. If we did it, didn't you? So, it? I mean, literally, like, correct 8051 code is the difference between this thing running and not, not running really for us. Not correct. Yeah. 80, like, it's, it's hot patched in RAM, correct? Like, like, like scribble over some bytes to make it work. Uh, that, that's how it goes. Um, but yeah, just to, to, to sort of circle back to the beginning of our, like, our NCSI conversation. So, imagine a, a, a NIC for a 100 gig link that has. Uh, storage acceleration pieces. It has uh, uh, other like hi higher end CPU cores, DRAM controllers, like all this other jazz. Like we're the, the stuff that we're talking that that we feel is gross and complicated. That's just a one gig little like a little one gig phi that is with you know a data sheet that is a uh, what two three hundred pages long. A register spec for maybe I don't know three hundred pages, a little bit less probably. I don't I I, I forgot. Not that complicated in, in comparison, uh, but even there, it's already that that already took us a lot of time and effort to get working reliable and, and reverse engineer our way through, and that was with open, with open code mostly. Um, yeah, and to their credit, like Microchip publishes all this stuff, and you can just go read through it uh, without signing any NDAs or anything. This and we because... actually we would have been dead in the water without that. I mean, I think it, that's not yes. exaggerating, right, Matt? Yes. Yeah, it, well, it, it was funny though. As as you, as you read through it, you see notes about you know this fixes Bugzilla number something something something. <laughs> yeah, like, there are like hints of microchip internal documents where they say like you know configure auto negotiation per UG ten thirty five. Uh, and I've I would love to get my hands on some of those documents. So microchip, if you're listening, send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was part of the criteria why we selected these parts because the um to come back on this inventory problem a little bit these parts were not necessarily automotive great and so that kept us out of the crunch that happened in 2020 and then um or they were just not as common in order for automotive applications and then uh the other part was that we had i had looked at this at the i'd seen that these drivers were open source that that for, for example the phi is supported in the linux kernel and so we had some some confidence that okay we will probably be able to make our way through this and 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 make get it to work um given that there's enough sort of open code floating for these out like outside the microchip walls and it's, although it's, even with the even with the parts being not automotive grade, we ended up building with two different FIs. So we have a oh yeah, eight, because it was still eighty five yeah, like a VSC eight five five two and a VSC eight five six two, which turns out are totally different, like totally different bring up sequences, uh, different architectures internally. So we have to support both of those simultaneously. Well, but they're sort of pin compatible. They were they, I forgot what the FIE called it. It's like the marketing. Uh, they like to so basically the the major difference between the two parts is that the the sixty two was the the next generation that supported MacSAC, so you could have uh, at the Mac level use encryption with certificates. Uh, none of that we use. We do pay for it, but we don't use it. Um, but the because there was just no inventory of the parts that we wanted because yeah, someone someone yeah, I think is the, buying the part everything. that we wanted. We had I believe it was our record setter at a ninety three week lead time. Um, yes. and I like hey, at what point do you just <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. It's like oh, so, I'm sorry, like, two week. I'm sorry. Good news. Yeah, good news, everybody. I mean, just like okay, so what, at what point do you just say like, no, we don't make this? It's like I we just like write down like fuck you on a piece of paper. I I mean, it's like, like wait, you know, at what two point? And a half is it like, years at some point. Yeah, it's like it's not. That's not a lead time. Like that's not that's not right. That's a, that's a, I don't know. At some point, this kind of cuts over, and you can't. Like, the problem was um, we had actually purchased a, a, quite a bit. We had purchased some, as in like ends of them maybe a hundred right we had right. we had enough for sort of a first couple of builds 
That's why, so we procured enough so that we could build sort of until DVT. And then we figured that there would be enough lead time to sort of procure, procure the rest. And then, uh, but then it turns out that they could be, we're just not going to get these in time. So we switched to the higher end part, which was electrically mostly compatible. We had to do some footprint jiggery to make that work. Uh, write a lot of different, like Matt had to write new code for it. And now we have still a bunch of these 8552 parts sit in inventory that we kind of have no use for because we're probably never going to use them because I don't know if the lead times have actually already come down. Maybe they have at this point, but do we care? I don't know. I don't, so, I don't know. And so, Matt, I'd love for you to get to some of your methodology in terms of how you develop the software here because you took, I mean, this is obviously like a complicated thing to wrap one's brain around this whole thing. And one of the things I loved about your approach is you, as you went to each one of these building blocks, you really put in a lot of tooling to understand like how the part was working and that we've, we've been able to like keep using that tooling. You, you, you want to speak a little bit to your methodology there? Yeah. So like, like we've said, we started from their SDK, which also includes uh, full register definitions. Uh, even some fields which are not defined in the register list are defined in their SDK. Uh, but of course it's not, machine readable in theory. It is uh, a bunch of C uh, preprocessor macros to like select bits and so on, uh, but it does include doxygen comments. And so one of the very first things I did was wrote a terrible half of a doxygen parser that was just sufficient to read through these structured headers and spit out uh, metadata basically to figure out, you know, from these structured headers, build me a Rust struct that has all of these registers and the pins within them and getters and setter functions and documentation for all of that. And so that was kind of the foundation for all of the tooling that we ended up building on top of that. So after making the world's worst Doxygen parser, um, I had a bunch <laughs> of Rust code and could start talking to the chip. So I started with like uh, the basic SPI connection where I could read and write registers uh, and then started plumbing the metadata through. So instead of just reading and writing raw addresses, you could specify names of registers. So like write port zeros configuration register with this value, read it back and have it pretty printed and actually show you like what's going on inside of those registers. And then from there, it was just a lot of going through the SDK and figuring out what it was doing at each step to bring things up. Um, so I think I you know, picked one of the protocols. I think probably SGMII was the easiest um, and started porting over the configuration code for that. Uh, bought a different, like an off-the-shelf network switch so I could have a test bed where I plugged from the dev kit to the off-the-shelf switch. And if I could get bytes flowing in both directions, that was a good sign. Uh, and then continued to build a bunch of tooling around this so that you could kind of check the status of the system at all times. So unfortunately, Adam, I have, or I have some screenshots here. Let's see if I can post some pictures of the tooling. It, it, yeah, it'll be in the show notes, yeah. And Matt, I'm sure... You had, you know, we do, we, we've talked about this before that we do this kind of weekly demos. And at some point in time, once you got some of this working where you were at least configuring the switch on your own, I remember that you did a, a demo where the then, the, yes. the, the, could you describe that a little bit? Because that was, I mean, I think an early, yes, so, act, a terrific oxide showmanship. So once I had enough to kind of boot the switch and configure the RJ45 port on the front, and the SGMII link to a different off-the-shelf switch. Um, I set up a demo where I kind of showed this. I showed that you could look at the port status and look at counters and see packets flowing through it. Uh, and then midway through the demo, I revealed that I was actually running my home internet through the switch. So it was coming from the wall to my modem to the switch uh, via RJ45 out to the SGMII switch or to cable to the other switch and then to my Wi-Fi router. And that was how I was connected. Uh, and to prove that, I turned the port off and immediately dropped off the video call, and then well, back on and which is back. a great demo, like a, a, great, a great demo, demo. S stage dive too, where you see it. And now, when I turn it off, and he's gone. Okay, I guess that's working as intended. Yeah, and so yeah, let me see some screenshots. So here's a good example of tooling. This is actually for the um, SP side of things, um, but this is showing running the a status command, which shows you the status of both internal links in the system. So these are the two different buys that Ariane was talking about of the um, RMII and then 100 base FX and then SGMII out. Uh, and then it also shows the MAC tables, which I found 
invaluable when trying to figure out what was going on because the MAC tables are essentially ground truth for what packets the switch has seen. Whenever a packet goes into a port on the switch, it looks at the MAC address and then it uses that if you try to send packets to that MAC address in the future. And so this is a really good example of, you know, if a packet has gone through and we see the MAC address, we know that it's arrived. It doesn't matter if either side has actually like admitted it, if this really tells you whether the switch has seen it. So after a lot of grinding, we finally had all of the different ports and protocols and FIs working, and I started doing some higher level tooling. Um, so this is a picture of the monorail status subcommand, uh, which you can run on the hardware, and it will tell you every single port in the system, whether it's up or down, uh, how fast it is, uh, whether if there's a FI attached, whether the FI is up or down. And so this is kind of our, our one-stop shop for looking at system status, and this has been extremely helpful extremely helpful so i love this for a bunch of reasons i feel like this has also got great pedagogical value in terms of like if you want to understand like if you understand the output of monorail status you actually understand a lot about the network and um it the i love this thing matt and adam i don't know if you you have had to run this thing in anger or not um no but, but this is spectacular Oh, it is. And because, you know, and Adam, and we obviously saw this a lot with D-Trace, where you, people will be like, there's a big difference in watching someone else use D-Trace than, and actually eating it yourself to get your own butt out of the fryer. Um, and the I feel this way about monorail status. Matt, I'd obviously seen this before. It looks great. I, I love it. Uh, but then just recently, you know, we were trying to debug some issues and I needed to run it myself. And it was like, oh my God, I love this thing. It's, it is, <laughs> it is uh, really extraordinary um, because it just, it just tells you a lot about the system. Um, and there's a lot that you know just by looking at this thing. Yeah. And so this has been done for a while. Like it's in, been in pretty good shape and a lot of the remaining work has been kind of ironing out weird issues. So the, the link between the monorail switch and the big switch is something that Aryan could probably say more about, but has been pernicious. It occasionally goes down and you know, starts refusing to auto-negotiate. So it's been a lot of figuring out stuff like that and either figuring out fixes or uh, more recently adding watchdogs to detect when various sides of the link are stuck to like manually kick them to cause them to reset yeah and i think i mean this is one where we we definitely know we are big time on our own because you know we've got the, the 7448 talking to Fino. like pretty sure we can say with confidence that we're the only ones on the planet doing that i mean i i don't think anyone else has done this before and the fact that it is occasionally misbehaving it's kind of hard to know matt right we, that, that that could be a bunch of different things um that could be on the Tofino side, for sure, it could be on the 7448 side. It could be the way we've configured it. It's hard to exactly know what's going on there. Yeah, and it doesn't help that the, the auto negotiation is pretty opaque. Um, like, as, even especially on the Tofino side, you just kind of see it going into auto negotiation and then going into link training. And sometimes it makes it out of those two stages, and sometimes it doesn't. On the 7448, you have a little bit more visibility in that you can see it through the auto negotiation state machine, but this is not super well documented. So, yeah, it's it's tricky. Uh, but with sufficient amounts of watchdogging, we can just detect when it gets stuck and reset the link in that case. And that seems to cause it to come back up. Which is a relief. Um, yes. I mean, that is uh, because these are one of these things that like this can be a re this is obviously really problematic. If this link goes down and we can't reset it, it can't restart. Um, we are uh, we're in hot water pretty quickly. So we need to. That's why we have two switches, Brian. What are the odds <laughs> of both of them go down? Exactly. Exactly. And so, I mean, and Matt, I mean, the, the, the presence of the management network, I mean, now that we kind of have we've gone all the way through all of this, um, I mean, now the NCSI alternative just, I mean, we, we knew it was the wrong direction way back then, but um, oh my God, is that clearly, I mean, can you imagine if we were relying on the high-speed network and its functionality at all? Because we, we've been able to, to uh, really be able to understand pretty broken systems via ma the management network. This thing has, has, a, has been actually pretty robust. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the nice things about it is also that because it's not booting Linux and configuring the switch. So the way that they expect the SDK to work is running Linux on the MIPS processor and co-located within the switch. So it's 
doing direct memory reads and writes to memory mapped registers to configure the switch from within, which is very cool. Uh, but the fact that we're not doing that means that we are booting in, I think I last timed it at like four seconds flat. So the management network is up before you've noticed that the fans are like making noise when you power up the rack. Right. Yeah. And this is a really big deal because I mean, I mean we want to be, we want that management network to be up really, really quickly. We do not want, uh, and to get, just get that basic liveness of the system. Um, and it's been, again, it's been robust. And in fact, when it's, it's actually really important that it's robust because, you know, I think we got a new sense of appreciation. We have been debugging uh, gimlets or compute sled. We've been debugging them on the bench for, you know, a long time. And boy, when those sleds go into the rack, there are no dongles. <laughs> You know, you are no longer connected over your, the, the the kind of these debug ports that we've been using to debug this thing. It's like, yeah, we don't have this anymore. We only have the management network to now debug the service processor and then the root of trust, which is even further away. So it's, uh, we really need that management network to be working uh, all the time um, to be able to debug them. Yeah, so a lot of John's work has been uh, building, you know, well-structured tooling for kind of accessing everything about the SPs on the management network. Uh, and a lot of my work has been building unstructured hacky tooling for doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, do you, uh, do you want to, I don't know, which one do you want to describe first? Do you want to describe the hacky tooling or the, the well-structured the hacky tooling? tooling is, the hacky tooling is funnier. So this is actually, I mean, this is building on some stuff that uh, Brian did where he added the ability to uh, take uh, task dumps. When a task has crashed, uh, you get a record of its memory and then you can extricate that through the management network and examine it on the bench later. Uh, which is very helpful. And it turns out that reading memory of tasks that has crashed is like only a small step away from reading memory from tasks that are live, uh, which is only a small step away from kind of reading arbitrary memory from the chip. And so a lot of the work I had been doing was adapting our code that was meant to be using the debugger uh, to work over this management network. Because once you can read arbitrary memory and you have the elf data and the dwarf data from the binaries, uh, it turns out that you can actually get a lot of useful information out of a running system. And this has been extraordinary, honestly. And also, like, this network is fast. <laughs> I mean, we're so used to, like, going over, you know, when you're debugging on the bench, you are going over this SWID interface, which is going over USB, which is ultimately, like, USB is fast, but um, it is actually, it runs pretty slowly for, for implementation reasons. And boy, Matt, it is nice. It runs really, really quickly. Um, and I really appreciate having a, like a relatively high speed network. You know, this is not a, a low speed network. Um, and we've been able to, uh, you know, we, we've started to use that in a really load bearing capacity where we can kind of quickly extract the debug information that we need out of a task that's misbehaving um, and be able to understand what's going on. So in, in terms of the, um, and I don't know, John, do you want to talk about some of the, the, the better structure tooling? Well, Matt and I are, are kind of are, are hacking away here to, to be able to understand these systems. I don't know if you want to elaborate on any of the tooling that, that you've built on top of the management network or why this is so important. Sure. I mean, I don't, I don't know how far you want me to go back. When I started at Oxide last February, I showed up and I had, in my interviews, you know, there were open positions for a control plane engineer and for a, a embedded engineer and in my interviews i was like i'd really like to hop in between those two and i got a lot of well that'd be perfect we really need somebody to work on sort of the interface between those two pieces so that's i showed up at oxide and like day one adam sort of pulled me inside and said hey we have these like placeholder stubs for this thing we're calling the management gateway service which is how the control plane which is the you know host level software that that a customer would interact with on the rack uh, talks to the service processes over the management network. How about you take this and run with it? I said, okay, sure. You know, it's day one. Why not? How, how hard could it be? How um, hard here, could it be? Yeah, here we are a year and a half later, and that is still the thing I'm working on most days. Um, it, I mean, I think most of what it can do would not be a surprise to anybody who's been listening to the, the rest of this episode, right? Like, it, it exposes all the kinds of functionality that you would want from your, you know, service processor management network side uh, out like like the the fundamental thing is like being able to update systems right we can send updates to the service processor and speaking of speed like i think the first time i demoed updating a service processor over its network link I, certainly the first time i ran it myself it's like you see you know it's got to erase its flash which takes you know a few seconds and then you start to stream the update in and i was used to flashing it over a dongle where you watch the progress bar march across the screen over several seconds 
and I ran it over the network, and it, it was just done. With like, like I, it started and then it was finished, and I thought I had screwed something up, but I hadn't. Like, it, right. it just it's so much faster than going over a dongle, right? You can just write the thing immediately. Um, so the a lot of the I think more interesting stuff that that's become useful, especially in the last couple of months, is the way that the service processor is connected to the host OS, and the way that we expose that out over the management network. I don't. Can I dive into that? I don't know if that's yeah, right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, dive. Okay. yeah. So the service processor is connected to the host CPU. Uh, there are two UARTs that we're connected to over the host CPU. One of them is the the normal serial console UART. So one of the pieces of functionality that we've exposed internally and was absolutely critical as we initially put gimlets into the rack and lost all of our dongles is that the service processor and this gateway service can proxy out the serial console over UDP. So you can you can connect to essentially like you've plugged into the serial port of one of these gimlets, which doesn't have a physical serial port, um, but through the management network. The other UART and, and hold on, we well this is huge though in terms of the the, the I, and Adam, have you run Humility Console? Have you run? Have you done? Used John's work on this? Yeah, this to is, see the the console, unbelievable, unbelievable. And you are able to get it is. Uh, because John, you're able to make this thing like it's not lossy, right? I mean, that's is what it's it's not fast, but it's not lossy, which is actually right. really really important. Well, and you you mentioned speaking of hacky tooling, you just went mentioned my favorite hacky tool of all, which I did not specifically say. So, uh, one of the tricks with the way these UARTs are connected is that the serial console UART is actually physically jumpered to the service processor. So, with our original set of gimlets that we had on benches. That jumper was not connected, and you could actually just plug in like an FTDI dongle and get direct serial console access to the machines, you know, just like the way you would any other serial console UART. But once we started physically jumpering the that UART to the service processors, which I think maybe even on the latest rev of the gimlet, is that physically wired in? Like it's not even a jumper anymore? Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Nathaniel um, will jump in on that one. Yeah, I, think, I can't remember if, they, if they're installing the jumpers by default or, yeah, Nathaniel, we've. Production revs are all jumpered by default, and actually the headers aren't even populated. Right. So if you have a gimlet that's already jumpered, you can no longer plug in a serial console dongle, even if you have the gimlet on a bench out of the rack. So Brian mentioned in passing Humility Console Proxy, which is this thing that piggybacks on the management network console proxy, which is actually like a quasi-production level thing. It's not fast, but it's, it's perfectly usable. With Humility, you, you don't have a management network connection. All you have is a debug dongle. So because Humility already knows how to send and receive commands to Hubris tasks, it can sort of hijack the control plane agent task, which is, what is normally responsible for all the management network uh, structured messages, and tell it, hey, instead of evacuating your serial console out via the management network, just store it in a buffer, and I'll come back and read it later and tell you to reset that buffer, you know, with however far I've read. So you can, you know, with a, well, I don't know, 400 millisecond delay between each packet read and write, you can pretend like you have a management network by going through a debug dongle through this Humility console proxy, which is... It's great. delightful. Oh, man, it is so huge, because when you, the, you need this, because you pulled the sled out of the rack, and you know, this thing should be booting off of its M.2s and so on. And you've got to have a way, like, without having it plugged into a management network, you actually don't know if the thing's booted or not. So, like, when you need this, you really, really, really need it. And, John, I, I have needed it on several occasions and have been very, very grateful for it. It's really yeah. extraordinary. I think you've probably used it more than anybody. So I'm glad. Uh, certainly, <laughs> I, was, I was sort of flying blind. Like, a lot of the serial console stuff I implemented based on our Gimlet lits, which, you know, I got a few months after I started here, and I, I implemented all of the serial console handling based on that. And we started using it on the gimlets without, like, I had literally never tested it on a gimlet before somebody started using it in anger. So I was very happy to see that that transfer over. Oh, um, it works like a tramp. And it was, and you know, I have to tell you, when I needed it, like, I needed it so bad, and I needed it, like, I had just very, like, you know, you, when you are kind of like five, you know, le problems into a problem, and you're like, I need. Some I need this thing to really, really work, or I'm just going to burst into tears. And like that just worked like a champ. It was great. So for what it's worth, the reason you had that experience is because Robert had that experience, but the tool did not exist. And he, oh. he messaged me and said, hey, is there any way for me to get the serial console if I don't have a management network? And I said, huh, I mean, theoretically, sure, but I need to do some work. And he said, okay, and had to go back and figure out some other way of working around his problem. So you know, a couple of days later, this this 
humility console proxy was born and it was no longer useful to him but you've borne the fruits of his pain so that's I, I, totally and i i mean i think john we've seen this time and time again right where we when we stop and build that tooling we almost even you know robert found a way to debug his problem or whatever and moved on but we knew we were going to see something like that again in the future so and it, it wasn't i mean it was only a couple of days of work if i recall correctly it wasn't that bad yeah that's right it i mean it's it's very much a hack it was easy to, to throw in there and and you know it was not not a big deal and like you said, very useful. It was obvious when he asked for it, like, oh, this is going to come up over and over again. I really need to fix this. Well, uh, I think the thing I love the most about it is that you don't have to, like, because that's the way everything is normally connected, There's you don't have to perturb state in order to turn this thing on. You can just decide, like, uh-oh, something really bad happened, and now I need a serial port, and boom, yeah, you get it. Probably, yeah. Yeah, I guess maybe it's worth mentioning that the service processor in general is just pulling whatever the host sends across this UART and discarding it if it doesn't have anybody connected to send it to. And it turns out that itself is actually load-bearing. Like at least in an initial version of the host OS, if the, if the serial console jumper was connected but the service processor was not pulling any data, it would, it would not boot. It would pause at some point waiting for that uh, FIFO to clear. So it turns out that the, serial, the service processor pulling data off that line is actually pretty important. Yes, and I get. I, let's just say that I've had to debug that one several times over. We're like, why the hell won't this thing boot? I guess I'll, I'll connect a serial console to it. Like, oh, well, it's booting now. All right, what's going on? Yeah. And the, I, the particular other way I said, no, 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 Dumbo, you are actually connecting. When you connect a serial console, that is actually what's what's causing it to boot. <laughs> yes, yes. That released the boot gate. That's right. Um, so yeah, sorry, John. Then, I, I, I didn't mean to stop you and make you elaborate on that one, but that was that was an no, no. One. It's cool. I, I I'm glad you mentioned it. I would have forgotten to for, forgotten to talk about that. So the other UART, um, I mentioned. I said earlier the service processor has two UARTs. The other one we use for we, we call it IPCC, which I think is interprocessor control channel. Does that sound right? Plausible the, enough. Okay, so that one is because so this is, this has been really interesting because we control both sides of this link. We are writing all the firmware on the service processor, and we are writing you know, the holistic boot OS on the host side, we have full control over what we use that link for. And we have put a bunch of really interesting stuff in there, like the service processor can tell the host early boot time parameters, like which RAM slot it should read its its RAM disk, the first portion of its RAM disk out of, which uh, what bits should be set, set for a startup mode, like should it boot into KMDB or boot into... Uh, I forget what those other bits are, Brian. You've used this more than I have, so you probably yeah. Know. You can set all these debug bits for the OS so that you can run with like way more logging enabled or less logging if you don't need it, which is really helpful. Well, yeah. and then and and kind of a, a callback to an earlier episode, you can also boot over the not, not over the manager network, oh, but boot, boot over the, over, over K dot two, boot over, over the, the nick in the front, yeah, 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 over the nick in the front, which is which was useful when we didn't have the manager network up necessarily. So that's another thing you want, might want to indicate uh, over those bits. Yeah, that's right. So the the coolest thing, I think I, I'll go ahead and jump straight to the thing I demoed on Friday last week. The, I think the coolest thing we've built so far with the management network is the ability to completely restore a Gimlet, do a, a full OS reinstall. So the way this works is we have a startup option similar to all these debug bits that says, uh, let me back up just a second. So when the host OS boots normally, it reads the first 32 megs of its RAM disk out of RAM. And then that RAM has a hash in it of the matching, like the rest of the RAM disk that's stored on one of the M.2s. So then the OS will go and look for, look on the partitions of the M.2, try to find the matching hash, and then load the rest of the RAM disk from there. And see our episode on Holistic Boot for more details on that. We, we have talked about that in the past. Right. So we, we now have a startup option that the service processor can set, and therefore an operator via you know, our management gateway service via the control plane, that says that tells the host OS instead of looking in your M.2s, I want you to ask the service processor for all the data you need to boot your the second phase of your RAM disk. So the service processor, you know, obviously does not have the kind of memory it would need to store a couple hundred megabyte OS image, but again, it can act as a proxy out to you know something else that does. So the way this bit works is the host OS starts it it reads the hash from its RAM. And then it says, oh, I'm supposed to ask the SP. So it'll send a message on this IPCC line and say, hey, go fetch me, you know, the data starting at offset zero for host OS block XYZ, you know, with some hash. 
And the service processor will then relay that request out to the gateway service, who presumably is sitting around answering these requests with matching host images, send a block of data back, gives it to the host, and the host says, okay, thanks, now give me the block starting at 1024, and so on. And we can end up live streaming a host OS over the management network to a machine that has no hard drives at all or has dead hard drives that have, you know, we've, we've just replaced them with brand new hard drives. So we can do a complete OS boot off of just the management network. And it's not fast, right? It so, runs at, at like the line you, rate. <laughs> yeah. What what'd you say, Adam? It's running at UART speed. Yeah, that's right. The line it's, rate yeah. in theory is three megabit, which translates to like something around 300 kilobytes a second. And we're in practice, we're getting like half of that, which has not been a priority. Like to stream in a 200 megabyte recovery image today takes 20 minutes. Maybe we could trim that down to 10 with some work on the, the line. Maybe we could trim that down to five by making the process smaller. But like this ought to be a relatively rare operation. It's not the end of the world if we have to wait 15 or 20 minutes for it to happen. Um, and what we can stream in is some relatively small image that knows how to bootstrap itself, bring itself up on the main network, and then go fetch real software payloads that are you know, presumably hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes over the, the main network, which you know, does not have this UART line rate speed limit in it. And you know, then, then we can do a sort of full in-place update of a, of a gimlet that, like I said, has completely lost its mind. We want to completely refresh it. We can do that um, all via the management network. Well, and that's what's so cool about this is that we now have we because we're also going to be using this. Uh, and one of the problems we had to rewind a little bit is uh, how do we actually initially program the M.2s? And this is one of the I, I can't remember how much you were involved in these conversations. But you're like, how hard can it be to program? Okay, come on, how hard it can be to program the M.2s? It's like, you no, know, it's actually a giant pain in the ass. And we were doing all sorts of different things and had all sorts of crazy schemes to try to just like can you buy just like an M.2 programmer? And the answer is like, not really. Um, I mean, yes, I don't know. Go Google them and you'll find the various things that we tried and they're not very good and way they are all sorts of other problems. And it's like, boy, if we could somehow use this reset recovery path, this like dire, the sled has been totally wiped and we want to recover from nothing. If we could somehow use that path to actually build ourselves up into a full image, then we could actually use that for kind of our install in the factory. Uh, and yeah, the, the people in the chat are like, you can't just image the M.2s before you installing them. And it's like, yeah, trust me, we've done that path. It's a pain in the ass. But we we kind of came to the conclusion if we, if we could use the recovery path, it would be it would solve a bunch of problems. Um, and John, we've well, been able to do that not, now. Not just it's that. It actually exercises the recovery path at a very regular cadence. So you know that that path always works because it, it our manufacturing process relies on it, which means that we, we test it. It's fully, like it's, it's a fully functional piece of, of the control plane. That's right. Instead, the path of last yeah. resort actually will work when it's time for the last resort. Exactly. Like you've tested that it will work because you've installed the machine in the first place using that method. So... I'm a big yeah, fan of that. Those types of, of 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 methods to use, like train like you fight, fight like you train, sort of thing. Like always use the stuff that you actually intend to use in the field, uh, so that you know it works by the time you need it. Yeah, we do have a little bit of a chicken and egg, which is like to get to the management network, we need a gimlet to like program the switch and management network to bring everything. Yeah, up. you need one of them to work. It's at a, 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 yes, yes, for sure. That's right, but only one. Yeah. Like if yeah. if. Something catastrophic happened, every gimlet gets knocked out, you have to pull one out, fix it, and then you can plug it in to the switch and use it to reprogram the rest. Which means we can actually reprogram the entire rack actually remarkably quickly, because a lot of this can happen in parallel. I mean, this takes a long time because you've got, you've got a super highway connected to a cocktail straw when you actually want to get it, um, over this kind of like, whatever it ends up being 160K per second or whatever. But the, uh, you can actually do all that in parallel. So it's actually, it ultimately ends up being like not that bad to actually... And again, this is this kind of like very dire scenario where you actually need to to reimage the whole thing, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's right. the The limit this this one hundred sixty k limit is per gimlet, and you can just run all of them at the same time. That's fine. Yeah, and I think it it, it was you kind of think about like, well, boy, it, you know, are we going to put all these images via the technician port? It's like, yeah, the technician port is like the super highway compared to this thing. The technician port is like super fast. <laughs> compared yeah. To yeah. yeah, I I was doing the demo on Friday and I was like, oh yeah, we record the times of all these steps. Let me go, let's see. So it took, you know, 22 minutes to wait for the, the recovery image to be streamed in. Let's see how long it took the, it took that recovery image to go download the real software payload, which was something like four times as large over the real network. 
Wait, is this right? It says 2.1 seconds. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's that's probably right. Yeah, so it's <laughs> nothing in comparison. Right. It's, it is really, really quick. And, and John, that has been, I mean, obviously, that there was a lot of pieces. I mean, I feel like this is true for the technician port, too, when, you, you know, uh, Aaron and Matt were getting all the, just getting packets out the technician port is also hugely complicated and, and you need every single one of those pieces to work or the whole thing doesn't work i mean it's it, you actually need all of these links to be so there's a lot that was, i know there was a lot that was involved in getting all of that to work yeah absolutely yeah, that, it, that it, path works through like on another rube goldberg machine which is which i say a little facetious in the sense that we've really maximized the use of various components to combine and get stuff to work <laughs> In a cohesive manner, but some of this stuff definitely jumps through many hoops before it works. But, yeah, it, but I, once once we have it working, it works reliable. It turns out, so it's fine. Yeah, I think every every project I've done at Oxide has been putting together the work of other people, and in this case, it's putting together wor the work of I don't know, maybe three quarters of the company have touched like critical paths of this update <laughs> process. I mean, um, notice how many of our episodes we've been referencing, because really, it sits at the intersection of all of the hardware and all of the software. So I was literally about to reference another one uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. I think Andrew was on here talking about the Wicket TUI. Right? Oh, Is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, this recovery process, if you're a customer, you, op, you would execute this recovery process via this, this uh, terminal UI that Andrew was on here talking about a few weeks ago. And literally Friday morning, as I'm trying to get to the demo, right, all of our demo-driven development, the, we have a bug in the UI where it's like not refreshing the progress reports correctly. And as I just said, it takes like 30 minutes to run through one of these updates. A 30 minute lap to debug a UI problem is atrocious, but Andrew has had gone and built this, uh, this debugger like where you can just record a session of Wicket and then play it back at you know 100x speed. So I ran the recovery process once, recorded all of the events. Like the the update completed successfully. It was just a UI bug I'm trying to track down, and I can replay the session, which ended up being I don't know a couple hundred megabytes of serialized events at 100x speed and walk through you know fix this UI problem. I can take I took I don't know 25 laps and instead of 30 minutes each, it was 30 seconds each. It was it was amazing. It was amazing, and I think that the one of the things I loved about that, John, is that just like you were saying that you know, that I was the first person to to, to use the console proxy uh, and really use it to solve a problem, and how gratifying that was. I feel like for Andrew, you were the first person. I mean, Andrew used it, and it's like this it seems like useful, so I built it. But the fact that you had actually used it and it was a it was a, a huge difference maker for you, I think, was really uplifting. And it's like, all right, great, yeah, this is this is really useful stuff. Yeah, I think I think he said because he got I got I had to get up really early Friday morning to take a kid to uh, anyway he got up later and he saw this like debug screen of me with all these screenshots and everything he's like wait have you been using the Wicked debugger you just made my like it's it's 10 a.m. and you just made my day that somebody's actually using this thing for real problems so yeah it was fantastic well it really does actually there is something I I don't know I mean obviously you and I have both had the privilege of feeling this feeling a lot um and it is like that feeling of an engineer up here telling you, hey, uh, I used your, like the thing that you built just saved me a ton of time. Oh, or yeah. uh, or I don't know how I would have done this without this tool. And Matt, obviously we saw that with you and all the stuff that the tooling that you have built, John, the tooling that you have built. I mean, it, it it's really gratifying to hear that stuff, actually. I mean, it, it, there's something unique about it when a fellow technologist is using your tooling and it's it, it, it has bailed them out. Yeah, especially because often building the tooling, you can think, should I really be doing this? Am I building this just for myself? And am I, am I fighting the last war? So get, getting that feedback of, oh, no, no, no. Like there's, we're fighting that same war over and over again. It, it's terrific. It was, it's really good. Um, well, in this, I mean, I, we've just gone to this management network over and over and over again. And, and Matt, I'm not sure if there are any other uh, other particular war stories you wanted to elaborate on. Um, but, um, I mean, this has been so essential for us in so many ways. And I just cannot, I, I mean, it's even though it was a huge amount of work and Arian, the, the thing that uh, that no one else had done, but why, and why would you do it that way is the thing that has been really, really essential for us getting the system completely operator, operational. It was very gratifying actually that we puzzled this thing together out of the, out of the standards or sort of, and then in the case of 100 effects, a little bit loose standards, uh, or non, <laughs> non-existent. And then 
it it did work. It did work after we put the software work in. It it worked, and that was kind of kind of neat. Um, so yeah, that was pretty pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. it's it's been very very gratifying to see this work, and also to mostly not have to think about it at this point. You know, we we plug the system in, comes up, <laughs> things go up, and we can we can use it for things. So it's kind of faded into the background of just being a tool rather than being a project, which is always nice. It is nice. And uh, Arian, it goes back to something, you know, you had said earlier, and uh, we kind of mentioned Ignition briefly in passing, but this is kind of like this this primordial presence and power control network. And, you know, Arian, Arian, one of the things that you had said about that that I think is true of a bunch of things at Oxide is like, you know, we're going to work on this, we're going to get it right, and then we're going to be able to use it for a long period of time. Like, we're, we're not going to have to think about it anymore. And you know, it's it's always harder than we thought it was going to be. You know, we always thought it was like, how hard can it be? Uh, John, I love, you're like, hey, how hard can this be? Sure, I'll, you know, I'll look at this. How hard can this be? Uh, Matt, I feel like when you were working at looking at, at Monorail, I, uh, Monorail, I think, actually is like how, like, this actually feels pretty hard. <laughs> when I, that one does not feel easy when it's been handed to you. But um, the, you know, it, it takes us longer than we might like. But we, boy, oh, the, once we're able to get it robust, it, it becomes really part of the foundation. Yeah, I, I forgot to even mention Ignition, but Ignition control is also exposed in a management network. And that has been critical in debugging the control plane agent task itself, which is the task on the service processor that you know we talk to the, manage, talk to the service processor over the management net, network via. I think, Matt, you pointed out that it's, it's certainly become the largest and most complicated task in our hubris builds. And it has wow. bumped into a couple of very odd and obscure kernel bugs over the last couple of months, which just <laughs> nothing else had been complicated enough to bump into. Uh, Didn't but you that... two kernel bugs at once? I feel like, at, you know, in kernel bugs in, in Hubris are extremely unusual because the kernel's pretty small. Yeah, that's right. It, it certainly hit two within like a week and a half span. I don't, it may have been the exact same thing that triggered them both. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, yeah. But ignition control was super critical in those cases because when, when a service processor service processor gets knocked off the management network because of a kernel bug, for example, you I mean, you can't talk to it anymore, right? This is the thing that we are you supposed to use to recover when we can't talk to a machine. But because we have ignition control and that goes through the sidecar service processor, as long as it's still up, we can use that to hard power cycle the machine, which reboots the service processor and, and brings everything back online. It's absolutely huge. Absolutely huge, um, and the yeah for those the, a, we we've designed Hubris to obviously be very robust and broadly it has been. Right? Matt's pointing out in the chat that 100 percent of the kernel bugs we found, maybe two, have been in the the control plane engine. Again, just, we just don't see them that frequently because it's it, it's a pretty small surface area. Um, the uh, but it, it just uh, honestly uh, it, extraordinary work. And Arian uh, Arian's got to get going. Arian, we're going to let you return to your family. I know it's late on the East Coast where where John and, and Matt have joined us. Um, but uh, extraordinary work, everyone. This has been so much fun to see. Adam, I know you've been uh, you've been asked. It's like, we've got to do an oh, episode yeah. of the Management yeah. Network because there's so no, much here. For, for, for the past six weeks, Brian, we've been talking about what, what we're going to do on any given Monday. And I've been like, how about the Management Network? Now, how about the Management Network? Right. Management Network? So I am I am so glad uh, to to get this episode under our belt and uh, Arian and John and and Matt for for joining and talking about this. I I, I love this area of the system and I think this has been an uh, awesome summary of it. And um, essentially everything we've talked about today is open source. So you can get to uh, virtually Matt. All of your work for this is in either Hubris or Humility or in an open source crate that that is drawn on by one of those two, right? Yep. Yeah. If you go to Hubris and look at the monorail task, uh, which is in like task slash monorail, that's kind of the starting point for all the stuff we talked about today. Um, so it, a uh, and and then a bunch of stuff over on the humility side. You can see how we've actually actually used this stuff. So uh, all open source, check it all out. Um, and uh, uh, you know, terrific comments in the in the chat um, as well. I mean, one of the Adam, I think one of the things you and I have loved about Oxide and Friends is boy, they the, the demographic that we attract uh, is uh, our kind of nerds. So uh, a lot of great comments in the chat as well. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, especially Matt and Arian and John. Um, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Adam. You bet. Uh, and I'm just going to tease next week a little bit. We're going to have uh, Sam Tech on next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, look for an invite there soon. And uh, thanks again, everybody.